Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. is on a mission to teach one million women how to play the game of poker. She is a thought leader and frequent speaker on gender equality where she inspires audience to take action to create change in their communities and organizations. Please welcome the president of Poker Power, Aaron Leiden. Hello everyone and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today I'm here with Aaron Leiden. Aaron, how are we doing? I'm great. Happy to be here. I'm excited. Very unique business that we're doing, Poker Power. Uh, it's really actually engaging women and getting to get into poker and play. But before we get into all that, I want to know who is Aaron? Give us a little background. Sure. I, um, I have an interesting background, mainly because it is not linear. And not anything in my background would make you think I would ever be running a poker company for women. Um, if I go back in time, um, I was an English major and a French minor. I went to Bates College. I actually grew up in Maine, so stayed local for college. And I thought I wanted to be a writer. Um, that was really the, the dream that I had. Um, I moved to Chicago. It was 1992. And I uh, tried to get an editorial job. Um, so a couple of mistakes I made is one, I went to Chicago instead of New York. I uh, should have <laughs> headed to New York if I wanted to go into to writing and publishing. Uh, but two, it was a really, really tough time to find jobs in that area. Um, I did land an editorial assistant job, which is really the lowly, lowly, lowliest of the low. Um, I was mostly just correcting manuscripts with a red pen and quickly realized that is not the job I wanted for the rest of my life. Um, I left that. Um, I actually very serendipitously said yes to a babysitting job, which you have to understand that, you know, when you're a young woman and you're 23 and someone asks you to babysit, you usually say no. You feel like you're you're beyond that. I said yes, because I knew this woman was going to have a really good pantry with amazing food. And that's not <laughs> what I had in my little tiny apartment in Chicago. Um, I said yes, and it changed my life. And the reason it changed my life is she became my mentor, number one. Um, she also hired me to run uh, the largest uh, foundation in Chicago. So at a very young age, I was 25 at the time, I was promoted to be the director um, and so I was running a cancer foundation. I was fundraising for Northwestern Memorial Hospital. And to be honest, I had a Rolodex that most CEOs would be jealous of. And anyone I called up looking for a donation who was a senior leader in Chicago would take my call. Um, shortly after that, it's about a couple of years later, uh, Joan said to me, uh, it's time for you to do something else. It's time to do more. And she wrote my recommendation to go to business school. I only applied to Kellogg. I said, if this is meant to be, then that's where I'm going to get in. At the time, it was the number one business school in the world. It still pretty much is. And I went there thinking I would stay in healthcare management. What happened is that after year one, I realized that all the people who were going to make a whole lot of money were not going into healthcare. They were going into banking. And so I did a very quick pivot. Um, I hadn't had a math class since I was about 17 years old. And I turned into a finance major pretty much overnight. Um, I then interviewed for investment banking and uh, landed eight job offers. Um, and I say that because if this was 1998, it was a time when the big banks were really eager uh, to have women join. And I really had my pick of where I wanted to go. Um, I chose JP Morgan. Um, I then moved on to New York. Uh, so I finally didn't make it to New York, but, <laughs> but not as a writer anymore. And I absolutely loved this job that I had taken. My primary role was as a private banker. So I was working very closely with 100 million plus families, 100 million dollar plus families um, as they were selling their businesses, acquiring new businesses, and certainly doing legacy planning for their families and philanthropy. And that probably would have been where I would be today and you wouldn't be talking to me. Um, but what happened is about five, six years into that role, I had a child and then I had a second child. And at that time in banking, I always like to say that, you know, pregnancy was hidden. And the reason it was hidden is that there were very few women and there were very few women in my role that were having children. And I really didn't know how to manage being a mom, um, traveling a lot. I traveled every week. 
Um, and I wasn't very good at it. I wasn't very good at being a mom. I wasn't at all good at being a wife. And I really wasn't holding up my end at work either. Um, so I made the very difficult decision uh, to leave banking um, and stay at home. And when I look back on that decision, it was very pivotal for me because I never imagined myself being a stay-at-home mom. I had worked so hard to get to the success that I had, um, but I also didn't feel like I had any of the resources or the support system. I had no family nearby, um, and I really felt like I was up against a wall without a choice. Um, so I did stay home, and that was great for my girls. Um, I have two daughters who are now in college and heading on in life. And um, about, I don't know, I guess five, six years into that, um, one of my very original JP Morgan clients reached out and said, you, you've got to get back. You've got to get back. And I took on um, a few board uh, leadership roles um, from some small companies, so a public company and a private company. And it was exactly what I needed because I was serving as an advisor. So I was very much, you know, back in the business world, talking the talk. And that really was my jumping off point to focus on startups. And um, shortly after that, I went to Evil Geniuses, which is an esports, uh, legendary esports uh, company. And from there, I was asked about Poker Power. And that's where the story gets interesting because uh, when the founder of Poker Power told me about this idea to teach young girls, so really teenage girls, to play poker, I said, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. <laughs> and I can say that because I've known her 20 years and she has lots of good ideas. But I didn't think this was one of them because I knew from my days on Wall Street that women don't play poker and girls certainly don't play poker. And I also knew that I didn't know how to play poker. And so the, the thought of me running a business that taught poker um, didn't make a lot of sense to me. But I was really intrigued. Um, I tend to say yes to things that I don't know how to do. And then I figure them out. Um, and that's exactly what happened here. Um, so you fast forward just a little bit more. And I joined the, at the time, it wasn't even a business. We were really just an idea on the North Shore of Chicago. And I joined um, three weeks before the lockdown of the pandemic. And so what I thought I was going to be doing and the type of business I had hoped I would be running changed overnight. Um, and we very quickly had to pivot and create a virtual curriculum that we could scale and deliver globally. Now you have to remember, this is when nobody knew how to share screen. Nobody knew how to be entertaining, you know, in our little constraining Zoom boxes. Um, but we had a mandate to get this done. It was also at the time in the world that every company was looking for an engaging way to get their employees back, uh, turning on their cameras and interacting with each other. And so while the pandemic was very challenging, it ended up being a perfect storm for Poker Power. And I'll stop there and we can talk more. No, that's phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. In fact, I kind of want to take a step back before we get into Poker Power because I think you dropped some phenomenal nuggets. And I, I, I like what you mentioned in regards to um, your philanthropy, uh, philanthropic work in the past in regards to CEOs would love to have your Rolodex, which is true. I, I, I believe true philanthropic, uh, philanthrop you know, nonprofit workers, true, true uh, fundraisers have a phenomenal way of building relationships uh, and trustworthy relationships. How do you build a trustworthy relationship so individuals are willing to come? Because I think that's also important for an entrepreneur to know, right? How do you build these trusting relationships for them to come back? That is such a good question. And I, I've been a leader for a long time. I started you know, leading a business when I was 25 years old. So it's a long time ago. And the one thing that I can say I've always done is I have built those relationships and I do it because I'm not interested in the transaction. I'm not interested in the one-time deal that we can get done. I'm very much interested in what can we build as partners. And as you know, you know, when you're building something, there's always give and take. There's always things you can and cannot do. I look at it um, really with a long vision of I am committed to working with you. I want you to work with me or with my business. And the way we're going to get that done is by building loyalty, um, by helping each other out. Um, and often one of us is going to have to give up a little more than the other to start with. But over the long time, it's going to all even out and we're going to have a really strong partnership. Um, and I, I certainly do. I'm still in contact with many of the people who are in that original Rolodex that I have. Um, and they're always intrigued to see, you know, what, what am I doing next? Because it's usually not what you expect. Um, but I think it's because I am so focused on, on my network and being really genuine within my network 
um, that I'm able to to pick up the phone or, or send the text nowadays. We don't really pick up the phone um, and reach out to anybody. So in, in regards to that, you know, one of the things you, you kind of mentioned too, you know, networking. How how so for an aspiring entrepreneur, somebody that's not very aware of building networking, how do, how do you start to build a network? Oh my goodness, that, this is such an important question, and it's much more than just handing your business card out. Or you know, many of us now have you know virtual business cards that that we send along to people. That's really not it. You have to have something that you can offer to someone that is of value to them. And that's what I have found um, throughout my entire time in business is I have to be very quick because most people don't have a lot of time. So you have to be very quick with your value proposition or even think about it as your elevator speech. I, re I remember um, when I was at JP Morgan, I distilled my elevator speech down to I make rich people richer. And that always mm, got someone to laugh, oh, um, but that. they also remembered it. And they were curious because I wouldn't even say where I worked. I wouldn't say what I do. I just, I make rich people richer. There's almost no one on this planet who's going to not say, well, how do you do that? Um, and while what I was doing might not apply to you or be able to work with you, I'm going to start to have a conversation with you. And that's what you want. You want to be interesting. You want to make sure that you are exceptionally good at listening I have found, particularly when you're at, you know, you're at a conference, you're at a networking event, you, unfortunately, you're going to have to say yes to those things. You're going to have to get out there um, and physically be interacting with people. I think post-pandemic, that's critical that you physically are there. Um, and then you have to really ask the questions and then listen to the answers. Um, I, I have, for my entire life, I have kept notes. Um, so I know a lot of details about what someone will say to me, and I just jot it down. And I'm still very much a pen and paper type of person. And that's why I can remember, you know, where you traveled last, uh, you know, where, where your kids are going to school, um, the things that would be interesting to you that aren't necessarily just business related. Um, you know, I've, I've spent a lot of time overseas. And one of the things I always realized is that deals get done because of the relationship and the way you build the relationship isn't by getting right to, to signing of the contract. Um, there's a lot of dancing that has to happen. You know, you got to hold hands before you get kissed. And I really think you have to have the the investment of time and energy to connect to the people that you want to have in your network. Oh, man, I love every, you know, I love your tag phrase. I make rich people richer. I, I actually say to people, I connect people to more people. That's that's my tagline. And it's yeah. true. You know, I think having that tagline, having the, the elevator speech, you know, you're you're only going to get five minutes or, you know, you get two floors, folks. You get two floors yeah. with the CEO, the person that you want to work for, right, that you maybe eventually want to be in that role someday. You have two floors to tell them exactly what you want to do, and that's it. How are you going to, in those two floors, engage them and make them inspired enough to have a, want to have another conversation with you? And that's truly what Aaron's talking about in the elevator speech. I absolutely love it, and I think it's, it's super, super important to have those kind of at your back pocket, but not only for you as an individual, but for also you as the business owner, right? Having mm -hmm. having your business kind of elevator pitch. Now, let's let's go ahead and move forward to to actually poker power. We, you kind of defined uh, how you started it, but what is it? So we are an ed tech business. Um, we are teaching women and girls how to play poker, and we focus on Texas Hold'em. And we're teaching the game of poker so we can really teach skills and strategies that will be beneficial in life. And so it's simply put is, you know, we teach you how to play the game, but we also are teaching you the game of life. And the way that we do this is twofold. Uh, we have an entirely turnkey virtual curriculum. We deliver it 24 seven across 40 countries every single day. Um, and that's largely because of the pandemic, we were able to scale globally in a way we probably would not have contemplated had we not been forced to, to move the business online. Um, but what has happened since you know the, the pandemic has started to subside is that many of our partners, both corporate and higher education, we work with quite a few universities, um, they came to us and they said, well, we have so much fun with you virtually, but we really wanna play poker together. And will you come on site? And this takes us back to our origin story of that is how we used to teach poker. And that's how most people think of the game. So we have built a, a very robust curriculum. It's 12 lessons, each is one hour. So if I deliver that virtually to you, you're gonna spend half an hour in a big Zoom room all together. And then you go into the small breakout rooms and you play poker for 30 minutes on an app that we built. And the reason we built the app is we needed a safe space for our community to play and engage and learn. 
And we also um, know that there really are not gender neutral poker apps in the marketplace. And so ours is the first and it's a teaching app. There's no real money that transacts in that app. It's truly for learning and playing with the community. Um, so that's the virtual business. And then the in-person business is much more of a VIP bespoke experience. And we come on site for 90 minutes. Um, I'm usually the one doing the keynote. So I do a keynote on why poker matters, especially for women in the workplace. And then we do a poker 101 at the front of the room. And then everyone who's there plays at the tables. And we have one teacher for every 10 participants. Um, so it's highly engaging, very interactive. The, the room erupts with energy and enthusiasm as women start to win these chips. And what many people don't realize is that, you know, poker is a very social game. There is a reason why men have Thursday night poker nights. It's not just about the poker. And women have been excluded from those arenas for most, most, most women have always been excluded and they really don't think about wanting to join that table. It doesn't feel comfortable to them, but as soon, as soon as they see that um, there's this opportunity to one, play a competitive game that's highly strategic, and then two, start to develop those social relationships and those networks across the poker table, it brings women back. And then you just win a pot of chips, even though they have no real value, doesn't matter. We have video after video, we turn them into reels where women are scooping all the chips back. Um, and it's, it's this look of confidence that comes across their faces because they never imagined themselves playing this game. All of that then starts to translate to the workplace, which is really the North Star of poker power. I don't actually care if you ever go into a casino. I don't care if you ever play real money. That's not what this is about. This is all about taking the strategies and the skills of the game and translating them to become better at negotiation, better at problem solving with imperfect information, better at getting comfortable taking risk. Um, there are a number of skills that you can hone at the poker table that directly correlate to career advancement and, you know, really success, whatever your definition of success is. You know, I was thinking that the exact same time as you're talking about the poker, I'm like, man, I'm thinking about all the different strategies you have to put in place, all the, the risk factor, you know, the really kind of understanding, but it it also correlates to actual true business life, right? Which is really, really cool concept. And I really do like the educational piece too. Now, you mentioned you kind of started before the pandemic and then you guys had a pivot. What was the original kind of focus before the pandemic? And then what did you pivot to? Yeah, so prior to the pandemic, um, we were teaching high school girls. Um, so it was really an initiative on the North Shore of Chicago to help young girls be better prepared, not only in the classroom, but also for that first step onto the ladder. Um, we know that young boys who are then going to become their male colleagues, you know, when they're 21 or 22, they grow up playing this game. They learn it at summer camp. They learn it because grandma or an uncle has taught them. And they don't even think about it. They don't even think through the gameplay what skills they are building because they can't actually remember not knowing how to play poker. Um, girls are missing out on that opportunity. And we feel so strongly that the game is a foundational experience to have to help you become better at strategic thinking and critical thinking, um, certainly at taking risk. Um, we know that you know studies show that, that women are more risk averse in many scenarios. Partly that's just because we don't have practice taking risk. Boys are taking risk on the playground from kindergarten. You know, they're pushing each other around, they're kicking the ball, and the girls are going down the slide and playing on the swings. And we need to get girls into those competitive spaces at a really young age. So that was the premise of the business. Um, it was challenging because most people, when they hear the word poker, they think of gambling, they think of betting and bluffing, they think of dark, smoky basements, they think of alcohol. So all things that you probably don't want your young daughter or really your young son um, being around. We, for three and a half years, we have been shifting the perspective on the word poker. And it's very deliberate. We want poker to represent what it truly represents, which is skill building and very applicable strategies for real life. Um, but starting with you know an underage population, having to get the buy-in from the schools, the parents, um, that was tough. It's still tough today. Um, when we made the pivot because of the pandemic to focus on working women, slam dunk. They, they understand very quickly what the value proposition is. And what's so great is that these women are learning with us and now they're bringing it home. Because as I said, you don't play alone. You got to play poker with someone. 
they are teaching their children. So we are still actually accomplishing what we had hoped to accomplish in the beginning is getting these young women um, before they go to college to play the game. We just had to get the moms first. Uh, so now we have the moms, now we're getting the daughters. And in fact, um, we are now actually partnered with a nonprofit in Kenya. Um, we chose Kenya because the, the word poker doesn't really have a meaning over there. Lots of people are not familiar with it, which meant it didn't have the negative stereotypes connected to it. Um, so we formed a partnership with a nonprofit called Global Give Back Circle. And we are in the process of teaching 5,000 high school and university age girls how to play the game with our 12 week curriculum. Um, it's really extraordinary. There, there is a photo and I'll send it to you after the podcast. There's a photo of one of our first cohorts sitting at a table. They built their own poker table, put our logo on it. And all the young women um, are in their village outfits. And behind them is a ring of village elders, all men. And it's just the power dynamic of this picture is extraordinary because you have these you know, very young girls who have now learned such a strategic game that's going to help them. And you have all the elders behind them in awe that they know how to do something that none of those men know how to do. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that is incredible. You know, I, I love your story because you went from like philanthropic work, then went to the finance, you know, investment banking <laughs> sector. Is, and then you're now you're in this, you know, entrepreneurial, I mean, you did business, business advisors, right, at first, right? Uh, but this is kind of like true scaling a small business. Is this your first time kind of in this kind of arena? Yeah, yeah it's, it's my first time being in charge <laughs> of, <laughs> of a small business. Yeah, I've, I've done a lot of advising and I love that work. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, you, you turn it off and you go on and do other things. When you are running a small company, you are running a small company 24-7. Um, and it has been exceptionally challenging to build a business through the pandemic. Um, you know, I, I've hired 25 people that first year and I never shook a hand. You know, everyone was wow. met over a Zoom screen. You know, think about how, how you develop sort of a feel for someone. You know, can I trust them? Are they the right culture fit? Um, all, and all you see is their little Zoom square that you're talking to. Um, we also had to figure out a lot of the challenges of running an entirely online business. You know, we needed a lot of software platforms. Um, I think the most challenging thing we've done is build this poker app. Um, and I, I always like to talk about things that are failures because I think it's so important for entrepreneurs to, to know that it isn't, you know, one right decision leads to the next right decision. It really doesn't work that way. Um, you make a lot of mistakes and you just hope through those mistakes that you're you're learning and growing and you still have a little money left over to spend on what will hopefully be the right decision. Um, but with our poker app, we partnered with a software software development firm and they were the wrong ones. Um, they could not deliver the M MVP as promised. Uh, we stuck with them longer than we should, uh, largely because the team, you know, my poker power team, we did not have expertise in building a poker app. So we were very reliant on our vendor. Um, we eventually pulled out of that relationship and found a new third party. Um, we've been with them now over two years. We love working with Pineapple. They've been amazing. And they are the ones that brought our MVP to the market. And we are continuing to work with them every day to add more offerings, features, functions into our app. Um, we really see the app as the long-term strategy for this business because we have a goal of a million women. And I, as much as I would love to personally sit down with a million women and teach them to play poker, it's not logistically feasible. So we need to use technology as our solution to reach that mission that we have. Um, so every day we play in our app, we run tournaments for our women to practice the game. Um, we're, we are actually going through a major uh, rebrand right now. And as part of that, we're redesigning the look and the functions of the app. Um, so that will be launching shortly. Perfect. And then you, you you use the acronym NVP for the listeners at home that may be unfamiliar with that. Yeah. What does that acronym mean? Yeah. So a minimum viable product. Um, and so that's really the first thing that you put out with an app is something that your super users, your testing population can start to play with. And what you're really hoping they do is they keep breaking it. Um, because particularly when you're a small business and you're building an app, you have a limited number of people who are available to go in and test the product. Our product, the only way to test it is you actually have to play poker on it. And your listeners may not realize, but poker is not like chess. It often is, you know, used in the same sentence. But chess, chess is perfectly solved. There is a proper place to play, put, put each of your pieces. Poker doesn't work like that. Poker is 
um, there's infinite numbers of edge cases that can happen because one, people bluff. You can't you can't predict for the erratic nature of a human who may decide to bluff a hand. Um, you also have you know eight, nine, ten people at the table all making different decisions as those cards come out. So the card piece as they get dealt, that's the luck piece of poker. Everything else is a skill piece. And again, that that has not been perfectly solved. And so as we are testing our app, we are finding things that are broken or we're finding these really small scenarios that if these three things happen in a row, then the app is frozen or then the app doesn't produce the result that it should produce. And the only way to do that is to test repetitively. Um, so it's very time consuming. Um, fortunately, we have 500 super users. We, we just adore these women. They are in our private Facebook group and they are the ones that have been so loyal and so willing to give their time to us and their feedback because they now all know how to play poker since we taught them. Um, and they are the ones that are really on the ground making our app better. Um, we had to incentivize them a little bit with some Amazon gift cards so they didn't give up in the beginning because <laughs> it was a little frustrating to play on a, a broken poker app. Um, we are now in fantastic shape and you know we, we play three or four games a day. I love it. You know, you mentioned a, a lot of things that have kind of been difficult about this process, right? The changing of the vendor for the app and other things. What would you say has been easy? Uh, has there been anything easy about this process? You know, selling poker is hard, um, partly because of those negative stereotypes that I mentioned, but also women don't don't understand why they should spend their free time or even their work allotted time. You know, oftentimes we go in as professional development at our corporate partners. They don't really get it until they get it. And the way that they really get it is playing. And so what then when has been really hard is pitching poker power, getting the contract signed, getting into the business. But once we're there and the women experience it, whether it's virtually or in real life, it is that moment of winning your first pot of chips. It is that moment that the first time you bluff and it works, that's the easy part of poker. Because if I can get you to have those experiences on day one, I know you're going to come back for day two and three and four, and you're going to continue to play this game. And the retention of our customers is so important because you can't you can't really get good at poker, which means you can't really translate the skills of poker to your real life until you play repetitively. Um, so we have to make that day one experience phenomenal. Um, that piece is easy. I have 20 incredible women who are the teachers. They are they are the front line of poker power. They have the most interaction with our community. Um, they are the ones that tell us what we need and what, what the community likes and doesn't like when they're playing. And they, they have a really good feedback loop for making those changes. Um, but I think, I think startups, you know, the way I often describe it is you, know, you run into a wall every single day, um, you bounce off, and once in a while you break through. And those breakthroughs are honestly what keep me going. Um, I like challenging things. Um, the startup world is not for everybody. Um, you have to have tremendous stamina. Um, and you also have to be really optimistic um, because there are so many things that can go wrong. Um, I, you know, I just think about when we went back to doing in person. Well, now we're at the mercy of, I have a travel team. So these five women who fly around the country for us. So we're at the mercy of the airlines. We're at the mercy of bad weather. We're at the mercy of the lost Uber. We actually had to figure out how do you transport 5,000 ceramic poker chips, because we have custom made poker chips. How do we transport those physically? They're very, very heavy. You don't, even, you don't imagine this, but we had to calculate what's going to be the overage charge, you know, the extra baggage charge as we're shipping these chips. So there's all these sort of logistical decisions that happen, which then affect what price you're going to charge your customers, because you, know, you want to make sure you have a good margin. And you can't, you can't just go at it like, oh, we'll figure it out. There's no we'll figure it out. You actually have to really do the analysis um, and use all the data you have. I'm a big, big fan of people capturing data. Um, so we have a lot of Excel spreadsheets at, at Poker Power that we refer back to. You know, one of the first things you said uh, when you were kind of on your conversation was selling poker is hard. How do you do it? How do you, how do you market poker power and how do you get out and market it and brand it in front of your consumers? And then who yeah. is the ideal consumer? Yeah, our ideal consumer is really any anyone who identifies is a woman plus. Um, so we're very welcoming to non-binary, transgender, anyone who identifies as a woman. And what we're trying to do is tap into that part of you that wants to accelerate a career, have more success in the classroom, 
or do something that is, is personally going to be really good for you. You know, we, we think of ourselves as the Peloton of poker. And what I mean by that <laughs> is if, if you get on the Peloton bike every day, you're going to do okay. You're going to be in good shape. You're going to feel better. Um, it usually has transformative aspects when you start to exercise every day. Learning poker is the same thing. If I can get you to play poker every day, and for 15 minutes a day, you're making strategic decisions, you're having to decide, do I raise? Do I fold? Do I bluff here? And you do that day after day after day, it is going to shift how your mind approaches problems in the real world. Um, when we meet, one of the things we learned early on is we would get referrals to CEOs, which is great. I'm so grateful for the referrals that have come in. But those were my wrong decision makers. The person I really needed to be speaking to was the person who was the head of the employee resource groups or the head of DE&I. Because those people during the pandemic, they had budget to spend. They had a mandate to get the employees online doing something with their, with their cameras on. And we popped up as this really innovative, um, at the time, you know, we, we made ourselves very cost effective um, and we delivered. We delivered day after day after day to build those partnerships. Um, when I talk about poker, I never start with, with poker. I always start with, tell me the problems that you're facing. And if it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation, tell me what you'd like to be better at. Because I'm almost certain one of those things you're going to tell me you want to be better at I can then move that into the poker arena and explain why playing poker is going to help you negotiate better. It's going to give you more confidence. It's going to give you, you know, the courage that you need to go ask for a promotion or a raise. Um, and so we back into it. Um, and then I always ask, what do you think of poker? Because I need to know what your framework is. I can't just jump in to, to assuming you have no knowledge or interest in this game because you may. And if you do, then I'm going to have a different conversation with you. You know, I, I love this because you're always talking about like encouragement and like, you know, this building, uh, building up individuals. Have you ever had a moment while you're building poker power of, of, of like, man, did I do the, am I doing the right thing? Yeah. You know, I think a lot of my doubt is comes from, from trade-offs. Um, you know, we have a limited budget, so we, we can't, you know, pie in the sky, we cannot do. Um, and it matters a lot to me that our staff and our teachers are well employed. Um, you know, I am running a women's empowerment business at the end of the day. I am trying to change the world through poker, but it's it's for women and it's to give women the courage and the confidence and the confidence that they need. And so I'm always making decisions um, with budget for trade-offs because, you know, on the other side of, you know, the team is we need to do marketing. The only way we're going to scale to a million is people have to see us. They have to see us on Instagram. They have to see us on TikTok. Um, we have to be at conferences. We have to be in the places that people will see us and connect us and be curious about what is this poker power thing. Um, and so I think, you know, my self-doubt always really just comes in the rear view of, you know, was that the best way to spend the money? Was that the best way to allocate people's time and projects that they're working on? Um, you can go down a rabbit hole really quickly when you're an entrepreneur because you may personally believe in something very strongly. Um, and in fact, it's not the right thing for the business. And I think I think it's hard to pull yourself out of that and say, really, you know, what is that North Star? I talk about the North Star every single week at Poker Power. And is this decision helping us get the count closer to a million? If it's not, then we probably shouldn't be doing this or at least not doing it today. I love it. And how, how do you plan to get to a million? That's through our app. So it's definitely technology based. Um, so we are going to be launching uh, campaigns on TikTok, as I said, working with influencers. Um, we really haven't done any paid marketing previously. And that was that was strategic. One, we didn't really have the funds. Um, but two, we really had to build the business, build the foundation of the business first, build the products. Um, we feel we're in good shape there now with the app. Um, because the app is available, you know, on Google Play Store, in the apps, in the Apple Store, anyone anywhere in the world can install our app. And we very consciously put in learning modules into that app. That, that you don't have to be in class. You can do them all by yourself. 10 o'clock at night when you're in your jammies, you can you can learn how to play <laughs> poker on our app. Um, and then you can play, we have bots. You know, we have a, a, a practice module in the app where you can play game after game with anywhere from one to, you know, nine different bots. That's really good practice for you. And nobody's watching. You know, women tend, what we've seen is they, they tend to get embarrassed a bit, you know, in the beginning, which makes sense. You know, totally. we, we, yep. want to, we want to do a good job. We care a lot about doing a good job. 
Um, and it can be intimidating to play poker when you really, you don't know the jargon, you don't know the rules, um, and you don't want to make, you know, a mishand. You don't want to play your hand poorly with other people watching. So we find that, you know, practicing with the bots is really great. Again, that enables us to scale to that million because people are installing the app. They're having these really positive experiences on it. And then the third step is you come to class. And so within the app, you can sign up for our virtual classes. Um, we offer those every single month to anyone um, who identifies as a woman plus. And so you can start to learn that way and really have your questions answered. We have live teachers that are, that are teaching those classes. And then you're ready to play um, in the daily games. Um, so through you know marketing channels, through really in continuing to increase the offerings within our app, um, that will be how we scale to a million. And you know, a little earned media doesn't hurt for sure. Um, and stories and being on podcasts, those are always really good things too. Yep. In fact, that's a great time to plug the newsletter, folks. Po uh, Poker Power will have this information on the newsletter. Please visit theshadesofe.com. You can subscribe to the newsletter. Now, I'm gonna. This is a twofold question for you. Um, what advice would you have? So two different kind of catalogs. One, what advice would you have for an aspiring entrepreneur? So kind of in your new role. Then two, what advice would you have for women from the, the empowerment section? Yeah. So I think for, you know, a new entrepreneur, um, you know, we've talked about network. We've talked about um, making sure you, you have that strong role of debt. That's number one. Um, because the way opportunities, whether it's opportunities to sell a product, opportunities to pitch a service, you have to have someone to pitch it to. And hopefully, you know, it's a soft referral for you, a warm introduction. Um, separate from that is I always say, know your shit. Like, do not call me up. Do not send me an email unless you have got your pitch buttoned up and you are going to do a really good job selling me whatever it is that you're, you're ready to sell. Um, I feel strongly about that because... You, know, you can go practice that with, with your friends and family. That's where you practice it. Don't practice it on me. So make sure you have really devoted the time and energy to practicing the pitch. And then thirdly, deliver what you promise. You know, the worst, the worst thing that can happen for you know, a young business is that you overpromise and underdeliver um, because people don't forget and they tend not to give you second chances. And so I would be sure that if you promise that, you know, I'm going to have such and such a product by such and such a date, make sure it's there. Um, so you spend, you know, you spend the first part of being an entrepreneur, you know, you're highly exhausted, you're sleep deprived, um, you're pretty stressed, <laughs> but at the end of the day, you've got this vision, you've got this mission you're trying to accomplish with whatever industry you're in and it's yours. And I think, you know, having it be yours and having that pride in it being yours is such a great motivator when, you know, you run into those walls, um, shifting to, to women, you know, I have been, a thought leader on equal pay and workplace equity for a really long time. Um, you know, I have a, a TEDx talk that I did and it's it's still a little painful for me to watch it because it, it brings me back 20 years ago um, when I, I didn't know that when I received my bonus that I should have negotiated it. I just didn't know. And the way that I learned that I should have done that is that I asked a male colleague and he received significantly more than I did. And we were very similar in, in, in our, our books of business and you know what we had accomplished. And when I asked him how he got such a high number, such high comp, he said he asked. And when I really thought about that, one, it just felt like a kick in the stomach because um, no one told me I was supposed to ask for more. But when I reflect back on that, since that day, I've always asked for more. Um, because the worst thing that's going to happen for a woman asking for more and more, more money, more time off, more flexibility, more promotion, whatever that more thing is that you are ready for and you deserve, the worst thing that happens is no. And no is not never. No is just in this moment, it's a no. Um, and I actually think no's are really good for particularly young women to have. Hear a lot more no's than yeses because it toughens you up and it gets you ready um, for those really hard conversations. Um, so I, I always encourage women to ask for more than they think um, they're going to get um, because your male colleagues are doing that every day. I, I, I completely agree. And I think this is also true for our underrepresented community members, you know, our BIPOC community truly ask for more. Uh, and like you said, no is actually a good thing because at least you got it out there that you're interested in and continue to move up. And now now it's in their ear. Uh, and as you mentioned, the worst thing they can say is no. But it's also a good practice, you know, like you mentioned, even going out and interviewing, having those interview skills and, have, and going out. And to your point, 
Don't call me and practice your pitch on me unless it's buttoned up as well. But I'm happy to give you some pointers and tips of like what can kind of help you with, right? Uh, but again, networking, I think, is to your point, Aaron, is so key too because it really truly does allow you, you know, the whole your network is your net worth kind of thing, and and over promise under, uh, you know, under under promise over deliver, uh, and that is in everything you do. If you're in sales, if you're in, in your healthcare, it doesn't matter what your role under promise over deliver because that's what's going to get a loyal consumer. When you start thinking about the marketing funnel, right? You're trying to get people down to just knowing about your product, to purchasing your product, becoming a loyal advocate of your product, you need to be able to deliver. Very, very much so. I really do appreciate that because I think that's that's very, very true. Now for the folks at home that are interested in learning more about Poker Power, where can they find you online? Where can they find social media? Maybe they're interested more about Aaron. Sure. Um, so I'm on LinkedIn. That's the best way to connect with me. Really easy. Um, for Poker Power, if you go to pokerpower.com, um, that takes you to our homepage. And from there, you can read all about the business. Um, you certainly can sign up for our virtual classes that we deliver over Zoom. And we have everything from beginners all the way to advanced lessons. So depending on what, what knowledge you're bringing to the table. Um, and then thirdly, I would say install the app. That's really the best way to get started is go to the Google Play Store or the Apple Store. And our app is called Poker Power Play. It's very purple, uh, so you can't miss it. Um, and you install that. And right from there, you can start with those learning modules. There are 14 of them. They take about five minutes to complete. Um, each of them has a really fun quiz at the end. So not too much high pressure, but definitely testing your knowledge. And then you could start playing against the bots. Man, that I'm I'm really excited about this thing. I'm gonna tell my wife about it because we actually like to, you know, she's actually much better than me, and she'll tell you about it in negotiation and blackjack. Uh, she she will not let me down for that one. But I really really want, I love this information. In fact, this information will be on the newsletter again. So please check out theshadesofe.com. Aaron, phenomenal conversation. Really excited about what you're doing with Poker Power. I really see it uh, kind of growing. I, I I truly believe in what you're trying to do and trying to make it from an education perspective. I also like the way you're trying to change the view and the perspective of poker. Like you mentioned, we're trying to get away from that dungy, smoky kind of perception. Uh, I think that's exactly what the kind of community needs is this is this is truly a fun game and it, it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to involve money all the time. Right. It it truly can involve just poker chips on a Thursday night uh, around a table. In fact, I, it takes me back to my mom when she used to play Bunko back in the day, that old Bunko. So, you know, but this is Are you from the Midwest. That's a Midwest I'm, I'm, <laughs> I think they brought it out from the Midwest. man. But yes. So. Phenomenal, phenomenal conversation. Is there anything else you'd like to let the folks know before we let you go? Yeah, you know, I always tell listeners if they're feeling a little trepidatious about poker, um, largely because you have stereotypes that might keep you from taking your seat. Um, it's it's so important for you to set those aside. You know, I always say, make a bet, take a risk and bluff, bluff if you have to. Um, but you deserve a seat at this table. And, it, and the table is whatever you want. You deserve a seat there. And I truly believe that learning to play poker is one of the fastest ways to turbocharge um, success and acceleration for your career. Um, so so I was very trepidatious to play. Um, I, I, I didn't think I was going to like this game. And turns out I play every day now. So um, I strongly encourage you to, to take a risk on Poker Power. Thank you so much. Aaron Leiden, Poker Power, making rich people richer. The best tagline I have heard. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I love it so much. Thank you again so much for coming on the show. For those listening, please follow me at The Shades of E on Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. We will also have Aaron Leiden and Poker Power information there on The Shades of E website in the transcription of this conversation. So thank you all again and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to The Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow The Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofe.com.